Okay, so welcome back. Uh, this is part seven, I believe, in our series where we're talking about ray tracing. And we're using Visual Studio and C++, and we're using a bunch of very wonderful resources on the web to learn about ray tracing, how it works, um, how rendering on your GPU works. Uh, in the previous videos, we talked about um, how to set up a ray tracer based on the ray tracing in one weekend website, which has an absolutely excellent explanation of ray tracing. It's got some code, so we we use the code they have there, and uh, we addressed one of the limitations of that wonderful code, and that is that it doesn't use the GPU. So in subsequent videos, we looked at uh, applying CUDA using NVIDIA's CUDA technology, which allows you to render that scene on the GPU. So we implemented CUDA to render it very fast, and it has um, reflections, and it had surfaces, and blur, and shadows, and all of that. So I encourage you to look at those videos. We also addressed another limitation of that, which was that the code merely renders the, the rendered image to a file. And that's kind of annoying, so what we did is we added what's called SDL, a library that allows you to render, like you see here, to a window. So we added SDL and we looked at um, some other aspects of CUDA and uh, we also looked at how you can, on Windows, how you can use Task Manager to investigate what's going on with your GPU and all of that. So uh, I encourage you to look at those previous videos. What we're gonna do in this video is we're going to address one other limitation of that ray tracing in one weekend code. And that is that it's really nice, does a lot of cool things, but it doesn't allow you to load uh, custom objects, arbitrary objects. As you see here, we've got a teapot. Uh, instead, it just renders very simple spheres. And spheres are very, very easy to model in a ray tracer because it's a simple equation to define a sphere. Something like this, not so much. Um, it gets kind of complicated. So what you have to do is you have to develop a ray tracing methodology that allows you to ray trace an arbitrary custom object like this. So um, we're going to, in this video, start looking at how to develop some code to load an object that you maybe you make in Blender or wherever, and then ray trace it and come out with an image like this. And we're going to use some of the functionality we implemented in some of the earlier videos where we are rendering like this to an SDL window. Um, so we're going to, to again use SDL and we're also going to use the quantitative bytes image class, QB image, uh, which makes it a lot easier to, uh, for each pixel, you figure out what the, the correct color is for your ray traced image. And the image, the QB image class, you merely um, feed your, your results to that QB image class, and then you can send that to the window to get displayed as we have here. So we're going to basically do the same as before using SDL and QB image, but we're also going to look at some very simple code from another website that allows you to render arbitrary objects. And the website we're going to look at is called scratchapixel.com. And we mentioned that before, an absolutely wonderful way if you want to learn ray tracing. And this channel is all about learning. Uh, we're not about just downloading code and copying it. We're about learning how stuff works. So we're going to go into some um, investigation using that um, scratchapixel. Uh, it's got great tutorials on how all this ray tracing technology works. And they also have some code that we're gonna use here that allow you to load this object, this custom object of a teapot, and actually do ray tracing as you see it here. And again, we're going to address some limitations, um, but in general, we're just gonna use that code and we're gonna look at how things work. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to scratch a pixel Dot com. You can see up here, scratchapixel.com. And if you scroll down, you can see all of the wonderful tutorials they have for free, um, talking about geometry and a lot of the um, underlying math that you're going to need to know if you're going to really understand um, ray tracing. And then it's got the 3D rendering foundations. Introduction, where do I start? Again, absolutely wonderful. What we're going to do 
is we are going to go down to this section here. It's talking about transforming objects using matrices. And at this point, they've developed a lot of really good code that does some of the basics. And if we go into this um, chapter here, they start to get into using matrices to transform objects. And if you go down to the next chapter, you can see transforming objects using matrices. You can see here is the code that we're going to use. And they were wonderful. They gave us all this nice code that we can use to learn about ray tracing arbitrary objects. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to download these three files, raytrace, transform.cpp, geometry.h, and teapot.geo. And you can imagine um, this teapot.geo is basically a definition of all the uh, vertices and faces and normals uh, defining that teapot. Um, you can right click and open link in new tab. You will get the raw code. All I did is I just copied and pasted that code into a file on my hard drive. And I did the same thing for these other two and we're all set. So just put those into a folder and we're going to use those later. The next thing we're going to look at is installing SDL. And again, you go to libsdl.org and you're going to download your development libraries, in this case for Visual C++. Um, and you download a zip. Now, I encourage you, if, if you haven't done this yet, go back to our part two or part three where we installed SDL. It's really very straightforward. You just download this zip and unzip it. And it's got the include and the header um, directories. You just have to make sure that your Visual Studio project is set up to see those um, directories, just like any other um, project you're going to do in Visual Studio. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to go to GitHub to quantitative bytes. You can see the name here, quantitative bytes. And you can go down to QB Ray Trace, click on that, and pick any of the codes. I'm going to pick, let's say, episode six, and then go into QB Ray Trace. Down here, you'll see QB Image.cpp and QB Image.hpp. Those are the two files we want. And you can just click on those and then copy and paste those into another file. Uh, another two files on your hard drive. So now we've got five files we're going to use for our um, Visual Studio C++ code. So now I have started a brand new um, Visual Studio C++ empty project, and I have added these five files that we just downloaded. You can see on the right, geometry.h from scratch a pixel, qbimage.cpp, qbimage.h, and then raytrace transform.cpp from scratch a pixel and teapot.geo from scratch a pixel. So you can just move those into your project folder after you start up your project and then just make sure that you uh, go down and include in project. This says exclude, but make sure they're all say include in project and you should be all set to go. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to modify these in order to add SDL and to send our rendered image to a window. So what I've done is I've gone through here and as I always do, I have added regions, pragma region and pragma end region. And that defines a drop down area that I can make my code a lot more easy to read. This is basically the ray trace transform.cpp, which is where all of the work is going to be done. And um, what I'm going to do is go through briefly what we're doing here. And um, then we're going to get in a little bit more detail. There's really not much changed from what we downloaded from Scratch a Pixel in this file. But there are some changes, of course, for SDL and QB image. So I've got an initialized section where it just initialize some variables. Um, I've got a methods and classes section. I just I've just categorized the code that we got from Scratch a Pixel uh, into a methods and classes section. Same thing for a render method, um, or the main render method. And then the main application, the entry point, which is basically not a lot of changes. So let's go through here and, and get an overview of what's going on. 
So basically, I've got all my include statements. I haven't changed any of those from the scratch a pixel. Um, and it's got geometry.h, which is referencing this geometry.h that we downloaded. All I've added here is an include for qbimage.h, which is right here in our project. So really no changes except for adding that. So if you go into your raytrace transform.cpp, make sure you add this include. The next set of code in my dropdown is basically it has initialized some uh, variables in the scratch a pixel code. No change whatsoever to any of this. All I've done is I've initialized in this line QB image and I've called it M underscore image exactly the same as we did in our previous videos where we added QB image uh, in our CUDA ray tracing in a weekend. So this should be nothing new. Now, methods and classes. All I've done is I've encapsulated the um, methods and classes that came from the um, scratch a pixel. Again, no changes whatsoever in this. I've got a clamp method and nothing changes here. Uh, they gave us a degrees to radians and it's basically taking a pi over 180. Uh, you're going to have to make sure you've got the C math. They, they include the C math, but just make sure you've got that in order to use the M pi. Um, options. Um, they're setting up options here where they're rendering to a 640 by 480 uh, file. We're going to use a window, but we're going to use these same dimensions. Field of view 90, and they're setting up a background default color. As we saw when we rendered it, it's like a light blue. No change to any of this stuff. All right, then we've got an object class and it's got um, ray triangle intersection. It's got a triangle mesh object, um, a load poly mesh from file function, no changes. That just grabs the data from the, that teapot.geo and loads it. And then we've got a trace method and a cast ray method and that's it. Again, no changes whatsoever to any of that stuff. All right, so we'll just drop these. And then when we go to the render, um, really no changes until we get to the point where it has, um, where it's ready to send our image to a file. All right, and what we've done, this is the code that exists with the scratch a, pixel, scratch a pixel code and it sets up a buffer and does an S print F and then sends all the RGB uh, values as chars out to your file. Um, when you first start this up, you'll probably get an error with this S print F since nobody uses that anymore. Um, so we can just copy this out everywhere from the char buff 256 to the OFS close, I just commented that out. And instead, I added this simple code here. So um, it's done the timing, it's done the chrono, and it figures out how much time it's taken to do the render. And it does an F print F to say, okay, we're done, and this amount of time has passed. And here is where I add some code so we can send this to the M image class. This is very similar to what we did previously with the CUDA ray tracing in a weekend with some slight modifications. Basically everything between these asterisk lines is new. So just pause the video and type it in. It's basically C out uh, P3 options dot width. And that's what this code is using to define the width and height of the render frame. So options.width and then a space and then options.height and then um, 255. Um, I, we need to change that. It, it really doesn't matter. It's just of little use to us. But what I've done is I've set up a, a two for loops that loop through I and J of the image. And J is going from options.height minus one where j is greater than or equal to zero and you decrement j. And then for i equals zero, i less than options dot width, increment i. And we're doing the same as we did before. Size t pixel index 
equals j times the width of the image plus i. And that's basically setting up an index for all of the um, 640 by 480 um, pixels, all right, a single index. And here is where we send the frame buffer for each pixel index. We send the frame buffer value, the x, y, and z values to the r, g, and b uh, integers. We're using integers. They used chars before. So we're using integers. And once we've got that for each pixel, we then use our m image set pixel as we did before, set the i and the j for the pixel uh, coordinates and then the r, g, and b values. And that's just going to loop through. Again, this isn't being done. So just like we did before, it's going to loop through for each pixel, set up an r, g, and b value. And the m image now has is a basically a buffer of the pixels that we then want to send to the SDL image. Um, here is the main function. And again, we're not changing a whole lot here other than we have to initialize the SDL window exactly the same as we did before. Um, and we, we've got our int main, our entry point. We first initialize the SDL window, and I'll show you that. And then all of this is unchanged down to after uh, it calls the render function in the methods and classes. So um, you, you do the render, and now we are ready to um, display. It has already filled the M image buffer with the, the final image, pixel image. And then we want to do an M. This is all new between these, these asterisk lines. We want to do M image dot display. And we had set it up before where you could specify flipping the image. In this case, we don't need to. Um, so I'm just setting this to be false or zero. So M image display, and then we're doing exactly as we did before. We're doing SDL render present P renderer. Um, we have a bool is running, and we're defaulting that to true. And here is our endless program loop. While is running is true, uh, we're polling SDL for the events to see, do I get a quit when I close my render window? I hit the X, I get an SDL quit then is running its faults and it will it will jump out of the loop and quit the program. We also had an SDL key down event we're not using here. Um, so you can just ignore this. Um, I just set the, um, the M image display to false, which is how we, if we set it to true, it would flip the image. I just defaulted it to false here so it doesn't flip the image. So this isn't being used here. All we're using, we're sensing the SDL quit, and then we will quit the image. So again, that's about it. The only other thing is I copied initializing the SDL window. Um, and I, I moved the, the instantiation of the QB image class from where we had it before to the initialize point where I did the initializing up in the global initializing. So we don't need to do it down here in the um, in the main entry point. So I commented that out. Um, I also commented out the is running and the image flip because I want to set those manually. And then all of the rest of this SDL stuff hasn't changed. Um, SDL event, uh, SDL window, P window. This is all just copied and pasted from our previous code. Uh, setting up the SDL. Um, we do have to make sure that we create a window that's 640 by 480 to match um, what is done on the scratch a pixel code. So I just changed this. I hard coded it to 640 by 480. And then um, we did M image initialize 640 by 480. And other than that, that's it for initializing. So at this point, we should be all set. Um, we've set up SDL, we've set up the M image, um, and we have modified this. Now, what you will notice is if you do this in debug mode, it's going to take a very long time to render. So I'm doing this in release mode. Uh, debug mode might take five or 10 minutes, depending on your machine. In release mode, I'm going to hit local Windows debugger, 
And you can see it's giving us an output what percent of the image is completed. And here we're going at almost 50%. And here's our SDL window. It's called Ray Tracer 640 by 480. And when we get up to 100%, we will see that it took about 20 seconds to render this, which again is a long time. Um, so we need to do it on the we need to look at doing this on a GPU rather than in probably one thread of the CPU. And it's 640 by 480. And um, here is our rendered image with a background of um, light blue. So let's now take a look at this teapot.geo. Um, this is, if you look at the Scratch a Pixel website, what they did to make things easier they made their own format for their object, all right? Because they didn't want to do a lot of parsing. And they explain like in OBJ files or FBX files, you have to do a lot of parsing to, to grab the data that you need. Here what they did, kind of unfortunately for us, is they added a, a custom object format to describe their teapot object. And there's 3,200 elements here. Um, so what it's doing, it is loading in that object and putting it in a buffer. And as we saw before, it's using this um, load poly mesh from file, which is in our, uh, our methods and classes region, load poly mesh from file. And this is exactly the code they have on the website that we just copied and pasted. And you can see it does quite a bit of stuff. Um, but um, one of the challenges will be is to convert from this, um, this um, custom format file to maybe an OBJ file or whatever. So that's one of the things on the to-do list. But as you can see here, it's a really great way to look at um, how you can do ray tracing on a, a arbitrary or custom object. And what we'll do probably in the next video is go into a little bit more detail on what's going on here and how you can do a, um, how you can render a, in ray tracing a custom object. And it all comes down to triangles. One of the reasons why triangles are so important is because only three points are required to define a plane. Um, with a square polygon with four points, um, they can be on a different plane. You can have like a bended square uh, or polygon, and it's not on the same plane. So this using triangles is really, really important for professional ray tracers. Um, if you want to have a custom object, you have to break it down into simple triangles. And that's what they describe in the Scratch Pixel on how they do that. So what we'll do is we'll look at a little bit more depth next time on how um, that all works and how we do the normals and all that. So uh, I encourage you, if you like any of these videos, hit the like button, subscribe, hit the bell notifications. Most of all, please let others know uh, that we're here so we get some views. Really appreciate it. Otherwise, take care. Have a really good day. Thanks.